Get ready for your weekly dose of pixie dust with Disney Coast to Coast. Hey folks, and welcome to Disney Coast to Coast, the ultimate unofficial Disney fan podcast. I'm Jeff DePauly, and welcome to the House of Mouse headlines brought to you by LaughingPlace.com, your up-to-date resource for the latest Disney news every day of the week. This episode is being released on April 21st, 2021, and here's what's been going on in the world of Disney recently. A replacement for Disney's Magical Express, the return of Club Cool at Epcot, and another ABC show showing off its synergy with a Disney night. It's all coming your way right after this. Haunted Mansion fans are certainly excited for the newest updates to the original attraction. And to celebrate, Who's It's and What's It's has a new Haunted Mansion-inspired tea highlighting the classic phrase, Is this haunted room actually stretching? And now you can stretch your dollars because it's so simple to save 15% just by using code DCTC when checking out over at whositswhatsits.com. And guess what? The code DCTC will save you 15% off of anything and everything you order from the site, not just the new tea. So go ahead, treat yourself or find a unique, magically inspired gift for a loved one by clicking the link in this episode's description. And don't forget to use code DCTC when checking out to save 15%. Hear the latest news from the Walt Disney Company in today's House of Mouse headlines. This week, the Tokyo Disney Resort offered an update on its upcoming Toy Story Hotel. First announced in 2018, the Tokyo Disney Resort Toy Story Hotel is still set to open during Oriental Land Company's fiscal year 2021, which runs through the end of March 2022. The location will be the first moderate category Disney hotel at the resort, giving guests another option between the existing deluxe and value accommodations. When the new hotel opens, it'll bring another 595 guest rooms to the resort and will of course have plenty of fun Toy Story theming. We can expect to hear much more about this project as work continues through this fiscal year. As you're surely aware by now, Disney has announced that its Magical Express service, which transported guests from the Orlando International Airport to Walt Disney World, will be discontinued in 2022. Now, Mears, the bus service that previously partnered with Disney on the offering, has announced that it'll be introducing a Mears Connect service to replace the route. Mears Connect will begin taking reservations starting in May 2021 for service starting in January 2022. However, additional details such as the cost of this new option were not disclosed at this time. But with that reservation date just around the corner, hopefully we'll know more in the coming weeks. Those visiting Walt Disney World and hoping to capture family portraits sans masks are now once again able to do so, with some restrictions. In a slight easing of the resort's masking policy, guests are now temporarily able to remove face coverings for outdoor photos, provided that they remain socially distanced from other guests. However, masks must be worn at all other times, unless you're eating or drinking while stationary. Currently, it's unclear if a similar photo policy will be observed when Disneyland reopens, but it seems unlikely given California's stricter guidelines. When it was announced that the popular drink spot Club Cool would be closing at Epcot but would re-emerge at a future date, fans were understandably skeptical. Nevertheless, a Club Cool comeback is now slated for this summer. According to the Disney Parks blog, the revitalized location will celebrate Coca-Cola in a fresh new way, while keeping the fan-favorite experience that invites you to explore tasty drinks from around the world. Meanwhile, opening adjacent to Club Cool will be a new flagship merchandise location called Creation Shop, where guests can find merchandise inspired by the Epcot experience. Both the Creation Shop and Club Cool, hosted by Coca-Cola, are expected to debut this summer. Speaking of updates, Disneyland's iconic Haunted Mansion attraction has undergone some home improvements while the park has been closed. Outside of the mansion, the site for the dearly departed pets will be adorned with some fresh landscaping and guests may even spot a few new residents. On the inside, another addition is the return of one of the mansion's original portraits known as April to December, which will once again grace the hallway. Of course, these are just some of the updates visitors might notice when riding the refurbished Haunted Mansion reopening with Disneyland Park on April 30th. 
Next year, Disney Cruise Line's fifth ship, the Disney Wish, will take its maiden voyage. But fans will be able to get a sneak peek at the new ship with a special virtual presentation hosted by the Disney Parks blog. On Thursday, April 29th at 11 a.m. Eastern, Once Upon a Disney Wish will reveal some of the magic that awaits guests aboard the new ship, including a look behind the scenes with Walt Disney Imagineers and the creative team bringing the Disney Wish to life. Fans can reserve their spot for the reveal event and receive an exclusive virtual background by following the link on the Disney Parks blog. The Disney Wish will set sail starting in summer 2022. This past weekend, the 48th annual Annie Awards were held, celebrating achievements in animation, and as you might expect, the Walt Disney Company took home several awards. First, Pixar Souls won seven awards, including Best Feature. Elsewhere, the live-action show The Mandalorian was honored for Best Character Animation. In television animation, Disney Channel's Amphibia won Best Character Design for the episode The Shut-In. Finally, director, producer, and past Disney Coast to Coast guest Don Hahn was honored with a Special Achievement Award for his documentary Howard about the late songwriter Howard Ashman. Congratulations to all of this year's Annie Award winners and nominees. For years, ABC's Dancing with the Stars and American Idol have featured their own Disney nights in a bit of obvious synergy. Now, the network's newest competition show is following suit, with Pooch Perfect announcing a Disney night episode that will air on April 27th. During this special episode, dog groomers will decorate their pooches and looks inspired by Hercules, Frozen, The Little Mermaid, and more, while host Rebel Wilson will dress as Cruella de Vil, which is kinda messed up when you think about it. By the way, the aforementioned American Idol has just announced its latest Disney night will air on May 2nd, so get ready for plenty of Disney fun on ABC. Following years of delays, the upcoming fifth film in the Indiana Jones series is starting to come together. Recently, it was revealed that Solo, a Star Wars story star, and Fleabag creator Phoebe Waller-Bridge, as well as Rogue One and Doctor Strange's Mads Mikkelsen, would join Harrison Ford in the sequel. Additionally, legendary film composer John Williams will return to score the film. Indiana Jones 5 is set to be directed by James Mangold, and is currently scheduled to be released on July 29th, 2022. Although Disney's Frozen ended its Broadway run due in part to the pandemic, a West End production of the musical is getting ready to take the stage. Disney Theatrical has announced that the show will open at the Theatre Royal Drury Lane on September 8th, with previews beginning on August 27th. What's more, tickets are now on sale to the public, with dates currently available through April 3rd, 2022. In addition to the opening in London, Disney's Frozen recently opened in Australia, and a new production will open in Japan and Germany this year. A North American tour of the show is set to resume this September. The Walt Disney Family Museum will once again reopen its main galleries on Thursday, April 22nd. On that day, the museum's Community Access Exhibition Veterans Voices Painted Realities will open in the Lower Lobby Gallery, featuring original artworks by U.S. military veterans. The special exhibition, The Walt Disney Studios and World War II, which is now open, will continue to be featured in the Diane Disney Miller Exhibition Hall and be open to the public during operating hours. For more information, be sure to visit WaltDisney.org. And now it's time to bring in Kyle Burbank from LaughingPlace.com to talk about some more news. Hello, Kyle. Hey, Jeff. You ready to talk some Disney news? Yes, some very exciting Disney news this week. There is some stuff going on this week. In fact, Disney has updated the Disney Look Guidelines. Uh, Now, for over 50 years, Disney's operating guidelines have included the four keys, safety, courtesy, show, and efficiency. And recently, a fifth key was added, and that is inclusion. The inclusion key was the result of a 2019 brainstorming session with Disney's Business Employee Resource Group, uh, and it was focused on inclusivity and belonging. Now, when did this officially start? Because this is kind of a multifold situation. Yeah, I feel like it. the key was announced a few months back. I, I feel like it was in uh, 2020, but, you know, that whole year's a blur, so it's hard to say for sure. <laughs> it's true. Of course, you know, new and updated experiences are existing, like Soul of Jazz, the Jungle Cruise modifications that are happening right now, and, of course, the new Princess and the Frog attraction that we can expect. Uh, they also have inclusive products with uh, adaptive Halloween costumes, which I think are super cool. These are the costumes that are, like, built to be around wheelchairs and such, right? Yeah, those were... 
Very interesting. Very cool. Yeah, and then there's the Soul Collection and a lot of Rainbow merchandise. And as far as mentorship, there's the Disney Dreamers Academy and more. And uh, supplier diversity, they're working with diverse suppliers across the organization. But the thing that really hit the news this week that a lot of people are talking about is the Disney look being updated. And, you know, this is like a big deal, not big deal situation kind of in my mind, right? Yeah, it's probably something for a certain number of people who who remember how things have been traditionally. Like, it was a big deal when Disney a few years ago started allowing facial hair. Like, that was a big change. And so for people who know what the Disney look is and kind of, whether they realize it or not, have kind of experienced it, they might see some changes. And some people might notice it when they visit the parks, and most people probably won't. Yeah, it is one of those things that I feel like the Disney look probably changes more often than people realize and then every once in a while something comes out in the news that like a a big deal is made out of folks what we're talking about is cast members at the disneyland resort walt disney world resort disney cruise line and u.s resorts away from a theme park will soon have more flexibility with the disney look which of course is a set of guidelines for cast members physical appearance now disney says the goal of these changes is to allow cast members the opportunity for more personal expression while also fostering greater inclusivity at their workplace last time these guidelines were amended was in 2020 so not very long ago and they've been periodically updated throughout the years based on evolving workplace expectations and feedback from the cast yet while cast members will have some more opportunities for self-expression it is believed that they will still be expected to perform their role in the show in a way that reinforces the theming of their location. Now, tattoos is one thing that's been a big Disney no-no for a long time. I know cast members who very strategically get tattoos placed on their bodies where they're like, okay, I know a watch will be be able to cover this or whatever the case may be. So this is a pretty big one. Yeah, and this one is very interestingly worded because you're allowed to have uh, visible tattoos for the first time, but... First of all, you can't have them on your face, head, or neck. So uh, Post Malone still can't work at Disneyland, apparently. (laughs) And anybody with a tear tattoo. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, And then I thought that, you know, anything on your arms would be fair game. But then as we got a little bit closer look at it, it says that tattoos must be no larger than a cast member's hand when fully extended with the fingers held together, which is very specific and weird to me. (laughs) I get it. I guess technically this one would almost be okay that I have on my arm, but there's a little bit of bleed on both sides. So I don't know if I could work at Disney. Yeah, it's kind of funny. They, yeah, I get why they did it. It has to do, it's more of a proportional thing they're assuming if you're a small person you have smaller hands and you know because a five inch tattoo on a large gentleman's body is much uh less noticeable than a five inch tattoo on a smaller woman or man you know so i i get the reasoning but yes it is kind of comical the way that they put it so yeah like i don't see if you're gonna allow tattoos i don't know why you wouldn't just allow like an entire sleeve like that just I, well, I think that's exactly what they're trying to avoid is something like a sleeve because, you know, I think a sleeve has a perception to it, right? It's a little, for lack of a better term, thug-like, I think, in a lot of guests' eyes. Uh, so, you know, there's a difference between wearing a sleeve and having a butterfly on your bicep. So, you yeah. know, the interesting thing will be like, I mean, what if I had... Universal Studios globe on my arm or something or the Tasmanian devil or something like that. I think it's actually more confusing the other way. I think having Disney tattoos is the confusing part. Yeah, I mean, you know, tattoo artists and and people who get tattoos sometimes do weird things like, you know, have a Mickey Mouse that looks like a skeleton or something like that. So yeah, I didn't see any verbiage about that, but that has to be considered right like t- it says tattoos that depict nudity offensive languages images or violate company policy are not allowed so there we go violates company policy if you're wearing competition and or disney characters in a bad light but what about disney characters in a good light what if it's just mickey yeah i think for show reasons that might complicate things i, I mean it's going to be a case-by-case basis i did see one photo of a cast member who had a deathly hallows But of course, you know, that's a small reference. Like most people aren't going to notice that. It's different than having like actually Harry Potter on it. 
Yeah. Yeah, it's an interesting move. Uh, and of course, then we have some changes when it comes to hair styling and coloring. The hair length is now at the cast member's discretion. So that's interesting and can be completely shaved if wanted. Hair below shoulder length needs to be secured if it falls forward, covering the face or name tag. So uh, this, I think, is mostly for gentlemen, right? Like, uh, I think women could have hair at pretty much any length before, right? Well, I think a, a theme throughout this, and I'm sure we'll talk a little bit more about it in a bit, but it doesn't matter anymore. You get yeah. it's it's you know gender inclusive, so uh, there's doesn't seem to be as many distinctions between a male style and a female style. It's it's up to you. True, and hair color can now be changed, but must be well maintained and in natural occurring hues. So blue, green, pink, purple. All that crazy hair color stuff is not permitted still. Uh, go to Universal if you want to wear that. I think they allow that. I don't know. But but uh, but yeah, so natural hair colors. I mean, this wasn't allowed before? You couldn't dye your hair? I wouldn't have known that. I When I first started reading this, I thought it meant that you could have different colored hair. That was a big thing for me, actually, going from junior high to high school, was that my junior high never allowed dyed hair that wasn't natural they allowed bleach that was like the loophole that i had was i was allowed to bleach my hair (laughs) but then so as soon as i got to high school i had green i had blue um and then of course i got a job and then had to go back to (laughs) doing uh natural colors that's funny so yeah so you know hair colors to me that's not very exciting news if it's just all natural colors it's i'm pretty sure that was allowed before there were a lot of people with dyed hair working at disneyland so uh, shaving lines or shapes in the hair is permitted as long as it does not depict offensive words or symbols so that's another thing i mean that's actually probably visually going to be the biggest change in my mind just because that feels very non-Disney, but not that I'd be offended by it. It just feels, it would be a little interesting to be like in Adventureland and all of a sudden shaved zigzags in somebody's hair. That'll be interesting. Yeah, I think that's kind of what you're saying. Like, it'll take some getting used to, but I don't think on the whole that this is, there's nothing that I'm like, oh, that's a mistake. I think all of these are positive changes overall. Yeah, I would agree. I think the difficulty when it comes to this is honestly the word cast member and casting. Because to me, just as a entertainment minded person and a person who studies studied theater and stuff like that means something to me cast means something to me and when you are being cast in roles not just being placed in a position i do get the desire from the walt disney company to cast appropriate look and stuff like that but i I do feel like disney i'd say 20 years ago really tried to cast better for lack of a better term more more appropriate to the story and in this day and age it's just like you can't do that like they're not being cast because of those reasons anymore so i do think that the word cast and cast member is part of the confusion slash problem in my mind yeah i mean i think it's still a show like even if there's some level of casting that's slipping there's still you know a show that's on stage like i think it still fits yes the continuity is just not there anymore right or or it's less there listen it was never always there i mean everybody had modern clothing and stuff even if it looked you know older or whatever i I don't know. It's just an interesting thing. Casting, in my mind, is very, very interesting and uh, problematic in some cases, I would say. So there's that. Shall we talk about earrings? Of course. Yeah, they must be simple and be worn in matched pairs in gold, silver, or a color that matches the costume. That I love. (laughs) Unless you're Joe Rohde. Unless you're Joe Rohde, of course, yes. But he's gone. I think a cast member should try and, like, portray a Joe Rohde look and see if, especially if they're working Disney's Animal Kingdom, and see if they can get away with that. I wonder if that would work. (laughs) Somehow I doubt it. Uh, Two earrings in each ear are permitted and may be clip-on or pierced post-hoop or dangle anywhere in the ear. So wait a sec. Post? What's a post? An ear post? It's just the regular stud. Okay, hoop I know, or dangle. Okay, so no gauges. Yeah, it doesn't say say gauges or probably no descending uh, lobes. Okay, so they cannot exceed two inches in length or circumference. Uh, body piercings other than ear piercings are not allowed. So, sorry, no eyebrows, no nose, no nothing. Ne- neck above, they get con- 
complete control still pretty much except for the hair <laughs> i guess so yeah and then costumes disney will also be working toward rolling out new gender inclusive costumes within each location an example of a location that currently has separate male and female versions of a costume is the haunted mansion where women dress as maids and men dress as butlers and i think that this is really the heart of the whole thing right this is probably the thing that started the conversation of uh we need updates i think anyway i think you're right i think that's kind of a good point that's a really good example of things you might not pick up on but are becoming more evident as time goes on and so creating you know not necessarily a third option sometimes a third option but whatever option you want and making that okay i think makes a lot of sense and you you know you also see the example of the haunted mansion with the cast member who has hoop earrings and he's got his nails painted which is something that wouldn't have been allowed previously honestly i think in modern times one of the best choices that were ever made as far as costumes are concerned was star wars galaxy's edge i loved this whole base costume with accessories that the cast member could pick and choose and i thought that that was i honestly kind of wish you know in some cases it might not fit but i i would love to see that uh concept Uh, adopted in more areas and locations and i think that that would also help with you know what they're trying to do makes things kind of more unisex so i i thought galaxy's edge did it really really well yeah i agree and i i think you know it just comes down to how many different pieces can you have uh it's interesting that they want to both make things simpler but then also make things more diverse yeah, that's like the one kind of irony of it is that you can uh, do whatever you want, except that we only have so many options. <laughs> yeah. Well, let's move on to some other big news we got since the last time we talked. And that is that Avengers Campus at Disney California Adventure has an opening date. It is June 4th, 2021. Honestly, a little sooner than I expected. I thought this might have been pushed to like September or October or something. What did you think? Yeah, I would have thought so, too. I thought it was particularly questionable that they put that this fell within the original block of dates that they went on sale at the same time so you i don't know if that was intentional whether people can choose whether they want to go for the opening day of disneyland or they want to try to wait until the opening day of galaxy's edge or not galaxy's edge but uh, avengers campus but it felt like that just caused more overwhelm yeah they may have been trying to split the crowds that way but like frankly Listen, the ticketing system was a disaster again. So we kind of need to talk about that. But let me just say, when you know when the new land opens, there will of course be Web Slingers, a Spider-Man adventure. That is the main ride. A uh, second attraction will eventually open, which at this point is majorly delayed, I'm sure. And it'll allow guests to board a Quinjet and take an adventure to Wakanda. You know, this is going to be the e-ticket attraction of the land. So this is they're they're kind of dealing with this the way that they did Galaxy's Edge, which honestly I kind of thought they would have learned a lesson in this. But when Rise of the Resistance opened so much later than the rest of Galaxy's Edge, I thought that that was kind of, they ended up getting bad press because of it, I thought. So I'm surprised they're doing this a little bit. Yeah, I would have been a surprise too. I kind of thought they'd go for it. But every time I brought this up, I was reminded that while they kind of announced that second phase, it had yet to be, I don't know about greenlit for the first time, but re-greenlit. Mm -hmm. So I feel like them including that in this press release is actually kind of newsworthy that it is going to be happening still. Honestly, I thought it might have been completely off the table. So you're right. That is a big deal that they mention it in the press release. I do think it was maybe a mistake because it's one. It's going to be like, you know, the Spider-Man ride, I assume, is going to kind of have a reaction like Millennium Falcon did, where it's like, yeah, it's cool. It's really well done, but it's not like Game Changer the way that Rise of the Resistance was. And I assume the second ride there or third, if you want to count Guardians of the Galaxy, will be like, oh, my God, mind blowing and... So it's interesting. Well, the one thing it has going for it, though, is this was like the first look we got kind of the rest of the land along with it. And there's some really cool looking stuff in this land, like the the Doctor Strange area mm-hmm. and even like the restaurants and stuff that I think have been really undersold about this project from the beginning. Uh, so I think maybe that will assist it kind of like Galaxy's Edge. Like, yeah, you have the attraction, but a lot of people just kind of wanted to hang out and see the details in that land. And I think it'll be something similar with this. 
I do think meet and greets are going to be a huge part of this land. Uh, they have said that you can come face to face with Captain America, Captain Marvel, Black Panther, and many others. You may even spot Spider-Man swinging across the rooftops above. And I assume that's in reference to that animatronic figure that we've seen numerous times in videos. The stunt. They released a new clip of it. Did oh, did you they? See oh, the... in costume, right? Yes. Okay. So yeah, so it'll be interesting to see how often that's used, because in my mind, that kind of felt like a new Fantasyland dragon that would be used once for promotional purposes, and that would be it. But this sounds like he may become like a regular thing in the park, which is very cool. No, this is less like, hopefully less like a Fantasyland dragon and more like a Diagon Alley dragon. Yes, there we go. Hopefully. So that'll be cool. The land, of course, will have special food and merchandise uh, and beverage options. The uh, Tons of locations. Pim's Test Kitchen. What is Pim? P-Y-M. Sorry, not a Marvel guy. <laughs> it's uh, the original Ant-Man, uh, Michael Douglas's character in Ant-Man. Hank All right. Pym. So we got Pim Test Kitchen, Pim Tasting Lab, uh, Shawarma Palace. and <laughs> Shawarma. Shawarma Palace and You Terran should see Street. Avengers just once. I saw the first one and that was not. Yeah, they they eat shawarma, remember? Okay. I no, I don't at all. I was sorry. It was it, a pivotal it's end not, credit it's scene. It's not my thing, buddy. I uh, just not my thing. So yeah, of course, Avengers Camp is opening. That that is very exciting news. It's coming sooner than expected, but like I said, I want to talk about this ticketing system because did you try, I mean, I know you're not in SoCal, but for anybody on the Laughing Place team, did you try and get a ticket or go through this process? Our Southern California reporter, Mike Celestino, uh, turned into an all-day affair. We were taking bets on whether his experience buying a ticket would be shorter or longer than our Florida correspondents wait in line for Hagrid's when it first opened, which was clocked in around 11 hours. Uh, I think Celestino managed to get it in like seven or eight. So, you know. Okay. That's an improvement. But yeah, it was a nightmare. Okay. So I did better and worse than him because I got through in three hours and I uh, unfortunately selected opening day and went to pay for it. And as soon as I went to pay for it, the site crashed. So I never got to pay for it and uh, therefore didn't go. Um, You know, listen, I am not in a uh, tremendous rush to go. I'm not... I'm not running to give them full price ticket money for a half open park. Uh, that's just me. I know a lot of people are. I am not. I was getting a ticket for another purpose. Uh, but yeah, I don't know. The The system is, in, is insane. And I just don't understand. This happened with Touch of Disney. This has happened at Universal Studios Hollywood when they reopened their store booking. I do not understand why these giant corporations can't figure this out. I mean, these are some of the richest companies in the world. So are you telling me like the enough bandwidth just doesn't exist? Or is it a situation of, listen, this is going to be one day of a lot of angry people and would rather just deal with that than put out the money that it's going to require to make sure that this thing isn't a nightmare. And I don't know which which one the answer is. Yeah, I mean, I have no idea what the technical challenges must be for something like that, except to say that Obviously, the opening day tickets are going to go quickly and then uh, some Avengers campus. But then now you look and there's still plenty of dates open. So it's everyone just trying to do the exact same thing. So you have, you know, you have to have a certain amount of bandwidth probably for those other things. You need to be able to make people to allow people to purchase those. But nobody is. And so that seems like wasted resources. I don't know. So there's two things when it comes to that. Number one, do you think it's concerning how much availability there is right now? Because other than like opening day and Avengers opening day and some weekends, availability is pretty darn good right now if you just want to hop on and buy a ticket. Do we have another Galaxy's Edge situation where, you know, they were just expecting more than than what they ended up getting? I mean... I'm sure I'm not the only person who's like, I don't want to pay full price for a park that doesn't have fireworks and doesn't have a parade and doesn't have shows. Yes, I know there are people who their only priority is getting on rides and potentially with shorter lines, but I I don't know. Do you think this is an issue? Do you think Disney's freaking out over it? I think they'll still be able to make money. We all know Disney can make money. But can they? Because we talked about... You know, when at one point they were saying, oh, the state will only allow 15 percent. And and we had both said, oh, it doesn't make sense for them. They, it's probably not profitable if they can't hit that 25 percent. So right now they can invite 25 percent. But if they're only selling 15 percent, do you think it's still profitable? But the people that want to go, the people are, who are going 
really want to go and are probably going to, you know, stay there all day and they'll probably eat more and stuff. I don't know if it'll make money. I mean, I think it'll pick up after we get past this initial hurdle with the tech things. I think people that weren't planning on going opening day or probably hanging back, just like we said with Galaxy's Edge, is that it was so overhyped that people were like, well, I'm not going anywhere near that until I'm sure that it's like calmed down. I think it's probably a similar situation. And like you're saying, like, yeah, who wants to go when you have to, you know, adhere to all these things? You can only be in California and they just canceled all the annual passes. So I don't know how many people are really anxious to go hand, you know, when's the last time a lot of these people ever paid full price for a one day ticket? That's something that Disney is, I think, going to learn the hard way. Uh, Although, once again, a lot of people gave $75 and sold out an event with no rides. So I do get why Disney's thinking, oh, we can charge $154. People will pay it. I get that. But right now, yeah, there's a lot of people who I haven't paid a full price to go to a Disneyland resort park in probably over a decade. I, I, Yeah, I can't think of a single time. Um, So... I think that that's going to be a giant hurdle for Disney to get over. Yeah, we might see that membership thing roll out real quick if uh, if things don't hurry up. Yeah, now my theory was or is that the membership will come out in September. And at that time, they'll be like, all right, and more stuff is opening. And therefore, we can now charge more. So day tickets will probably go up in price then as well. That is my guess and assumption. But like you said, if ticket sales, or maybe we're going to get some of those two-day, three-day SoCal ticket deals or something this summer. But like, honestly, if the parks could just remain as they are and sell out or sell well every single day this summer, they would probably make more money than they would with annual pass holders going to the park if everybody's paying for a full price ticket. Like, that's crazy. I don't know what's going to happen. It's very interesting. It's so uncharted. Everyone just kind of assumed that it would... I knew that day one would sell out. Yeah, of Beyond course. that, I wasn't sure. I did probably think it would get closer. I think I thought you'd see more demand in those really early days being filled up. But I guess what? They're probably selling at 25% now because that's what they're at, not 35 Yeah, I believe it's 25%. Yeah, one thing until I've, they get yellow. One thing I've kind of learned is that... SoCal people are not, uh, don't get me wrong, we're a theme park crazy here, but not like Orlando. I think part of it is, is there is so much entertainment in Southern California to spend your money on. Whereas in Orlando, it's like, that's what you spend your money on pretty much is theme parks. And so like the local theme park person is much greater in Orlando versus here. We saw it with the Wizarding World of Harry Potter opening. When that opened here in Hollywood, the numbers were nothing like Orlando and nothing like they expected here. So I think in even Galaxy's Edge, you know, that was disappointing for Disney. I, I just think there's the demand for theme parks is high, but not nearly as grand as Orlando, I think. Yeah, no, I think that's fair. And I think especially there are people in southern california who love disney and loved having an annual pass and going whenever they want but then they're like do i really want to spend 150 dollars to go once once i know <laughs> the thing that i was thinking to myself is like okay when the day comes that i go it's like i will be spending a full day there no, no more of this hop in for four five six hours sort of thing it's like nope it's gonna be a 13 14 15 hour day or whatever is allowed at that time <laughs> uh so that's gonna be interesting as well and like you said they will get more money from people for food because we'll be eating two or three meals there as opposed to, you know, one. Uh, So it's all very interesting. Oh, and they're also, you know, they're going to have that like welcome back merch and people are going to (laughs) think that it's like the biggest collector's item. Like, remember that time Disneyland closed for a year and reopened? Well, I have a t-shirt that says so. Let me tell you, if they market it correctly, they could sell 2020 merchandise and just be like super exclusive. (laughs) Just make an entire 2020 store. You won't find this anywhere else and it will never be printed again. Uh, They could do it. Anyway, we got to talk about quickly uh, during that presentation about Avengers Campus opening. This is where we saw a lightsaber, didn't we? From Josh DeMauro. So here's the thing. Let's hear it. This presentation was so weird. Because and this was only the f- press, right? Like this was yeah. Not, okay, this was only a press invite. Um, so yeah, go ahead. 
And so he does, you know, basic little thing like looking forward. We're excited about Disneyland reopening. And then he just sits and interviews Kevin Feige for a while. And then eventually like, okay, he's going to announce an opening date. Like that's going to be the news. So then once we got that, I went back to, you know, writing up the story and handling our news coverage uh, that I completely missed (laughs) this Uh part. And I don't think that there's really clips anywhere because we weren't allowed to screenshot or take video of the thing. And I don't think it's surfaced anywhere else unless you've I have not seen it. So I did not get a chance to actually see this, uh, which I'm a little disappointed about. So you missed the coolest thing. Apparently, Josh DeMauro, at the end of this presentation, took out, uh, what do they call the handle of a lightsaber? I don't know. Does it have a name? The The hilt? The hilt, sure. He took that out and then apparently turned it on and a lightsaber blade turned on and it looked exactly, supposedly, I haven't seen this, but it supposedly looked exactly like it does in the movies. And then he turns to the camera and said, yeah, it's real. So apparently there's some really cool technology that will be coming to Star Wars Galaxy's Edge sooner uh, or at some point. Um, I don't know... The question I have is, is this going to be like a controlled room situation? Although I think he was out in the open air when we saw this. It's very interesting and apparently uh, next level. So it's, uh, people are paying, what, two, $200 these days just for one we get at Savi's workshop. If you're telling me you got a lightsaber that doesn't always have like a tube attached to it and works like a real lightsaber, uh, hopefully not killing people, but... Uh, <laughs> I they could charge whatever the heck they want for that, I think. Well, I imagine that there probably is some sort of tube involved. It's just however it extends. However yeah. it extends and it, the timing and stuff. That's my guess of how you could possibly do it. Neither of us thought so, so who knows, but it's pretty exciting. I feel like we've been hearing about this for a long time, so it's kind of exciting. Um, I do want to mention real quickly, uh, after writing and recording this episode, there was a bit of news that came out following an increase in coronavirus cases in the Tokyo area. The Tokyo Disney Resort is limiting attendance to just 5,000 guests per park through May 11th. Oh, how many times is this now? At least they haven't had to reclose. Like, Hong Kong's gone up and down a couple times, and then... Paris just keeps getting extended. Uh, The thing that was most interesting to me about this story was they've been doing reservations. So I wonder if they've also been having low demand because it says everyone that already was able to make a reservation was able to go in, but they dropped it from like 20,000 to 5,000. So wow. Yeah, so that's that's pretty telling. Um, I did hear that Universal might be closing in Japan. So yeah, it's it's interesting. It's you know, it, we we're, I think we're all feeling, especially in this country, we're all feeling a bit of relief and yay, things are getting back to normal. But it is important to keep in mind everything could go backward real quickly. So go and get vaccinated if you can. So that happened. Just wanted to bring that up. And I do want to say something else, uh, non Disney related, just because it is theme park related. I went to the reopening day of Universal Studios Hollywood, and folks. The new Indominus Rex in Jurassic World, the ride, is phenomenal. And The Secret Life of Pets off the leash is one of the best family dark rides I've ever been on. Absolutely great. I assume Laughing Place has some video of this, yes? I believe, yeah. I know Mike experienced both of them when the Indominus Rex was working, so that was a plus. Oh, did he? Did I didn't know she stopped working. I saw her a couple I times. I saw a tweet on, I believe, Sunday of someone showing that it was behind a scrim or something no that's terrible oh i mean it was and of course there was a bunch of disco jokes (laughs) yeah and get a fan out in a disco light oh that's heartbreaking to hear and i hope that that is fixed very soon because it was beyond impressive it was quite phenomenal so yeah um, mike had very similar things to say i think he said his jaw literally hit the floor and uh yeah yeah, and it, the thing that was so crazy to me is when the T-Rex comes out, which is, you know, the same T-Rex animatronic we've known and loved for years, it, like, is dwarfed by the Indominus Rex. You're like, oh my gosh, that thing is massive. So, it's incredible. Theme park fans will love it. If you don't feel like you're going to get to a park in a very long time, in both cases, I would say check out the videos. If you do feel like you're going to get to the park, I'd say let yourself be surprised because... Unbelievable. It's going to scare me, isn't it? 
Oh yeah. Do you now? Do you do Jurassic World the ride, or is the drop too much for you? Oh no, the, the I'm fine with the drops. It's, it's just it, the startling. Yeah, I was. I've actually never been on World. Um, I haven't been there since. But yeah, I, I used to go on Jurassic Park. Okay, there is. Uh, uh, I don't want to spoil anything, but there was something, you know, I went on to the ride knowing that there was a new Indominus Rex in the finale. That was something that was advertised. But there's something in there that has an additional thing that has been added that I was like, whoa, and I did not realize. And I'm not going to say, uh, just check it out. It's so, so good. So in any case, that's uh, your theme park news for the week. Not just your Disney news, apparently, but... <laughs> Uh, so yeah, that's it. Anything else you want to add before we get going, Kyle? I did go to a theme park this week. I went to Silver Dollar City. Where's that at? It's in Branson, Missouri. Oh, nice. How was it? Good times? Yes, it was fun. They had their street fest. So we got some fun food, got a workout because that park is uh, very hilly. But yes, so it felt nice to go to a theme park and I look forward to going to ones that I'm more familiar with. And were there rides running or was it just like a food fair? Mm-hmm. No, their their rides are open. I, it's mostly coasters, so I didn't do them. But my wife's a big fan of Time Traveler. This was her second time getting to ride that coaster, so she gives it a big thumbs up and says it might be one of her favorite coasters in North America. There we go. She hasn't been on a ton, to be fair. She's not a big coaster head, but she liked that one a lot. Awesome. Well, excellent. Well, Kyle, thanks so much for coming on. I'll see you again in a couple of weeks with some more Disney news. Looking forward to it. To read more about any and all of the stories you've heard here today, simply visit the show notes at DisneyCoastToCoast.com or find the link to the show notes in this episode's description. You've heard the news, and now I want to hear what you have to say about it. Call 818-860-2569, leave a voicemail sharing your thoughts, and you may just hear yourself on a future episode of Disney Coast to Coast. Once again, that's 818-860-2569, or simply look in this episode's description for the phone number, along with a link for some free gifts from me to you. Now, folks, if you didn't listen to last week's episode, you'll definitely want to check it out as I interviewed Imagineer Kevin Rafferty, responsible for attractions like Mickey and Minnie's Runaway Railway, Cars Land, and so much more. In our conversation, we talked a lot about attractions he conceived and developed, but didn't quite make it into the parks. And next week, it's the return of primetime at the parks. The easiest way to make sure you don't miss any of the magic is by subscribing to Disney Coast to Coast on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Wherever you search, don't forget, it's Disney with a Z, Coast to Coast. As always, thank you to those of you who support the show on Patreon. You make all of this possible. If you enjoy these honest conversations about Disney and have the means, please consider becoming a member of the DCTC community over at patreon.com slash DisneyCTC for far less than the cost of a Max Pass. Plus, this month is a live stream Q&A month, so you could join us for that. You can find that link in this episode's description. Other than that, folks, have a magical day. Bye! Thanks for listening to Disney Coast to Coast. Have a magical day. <laughs> Disney Coast to Coast is produced and hosted by Jeff DePauly. Learn more about the podcast and become a supporter at DisneyCoastToCoast.com. This podcast is part of the DePodcast Network. Learn more about this show. Plus, find more quality and entertaining podcasts at depodcastnetwork.com. That's D E Podcast Network.com.